So welcome everyone. I'm delighted to have you join us today on this kind of very overcast midweek moment. So grateful to have your time. Um, as was mentioned, this will all be recorded so uh, and circulated back to you as well. So, you know, if you're missing things as we go, not to worry, you can watch it back. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time together, so I'm going to dive straight in. And just to give you an overview of, of what we're going to cover in this info webinar, we'll do a quick round of intros. I'll introduce myself so you know who you're talking to. Um, set the scene a little bit in terms of, you know, what what requires this master's at this moment in time? What is the urgency for change within the textiles and fashion industry, which is obviously the sector that the master's uh, focuses on? I'll then give you a little bit more insight into the program itself in terms of who it's been designed for, and what are the kind of component parts and modules and content that you'll be exposed to, um, and the practicalities in terms of part-time, full-time, hybrid, where, when, all of that stuff. Then we'll go through the application requirements, um, just reiterating what you would have seen online, but hopefully clarifying uh, some of that as well. And I'll also reflect briefly on you know, what this master's sets you up for in terms of career opportunities. Obviously, this is a very <clears throat> cutting edge space and um, it's moving incredibly fast. And so we're seeing jobs come online right now that we couldn't even have imagined a few years ago, which is just a fascinating time to be alive and time to be kind of going into the industry. But kind of hopefully giving a little bit of a framework of what types of roles do we see emerging? And that might give you a sense as well um, of, of your interest. And I do hope to keep about 10 minutes at the end, maybe more for questions and answers as we go. On that note, um, before I introduce myself, if you're not in a position to you know, share your screen and share your face, absolutely fine. But if you do have a moment, I would love to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. So tell us your name, um, if you wish to your organization. Um, and what I mean by that is we've had a lot of interest in this masters from um, designers or business owners who are you know, really running their own brand. Um, but also from those who are working currently within the industry and looking to use this as a chance to upskill. So if you feel comfortable to share, if you have an organization affiliation, then, then please do. Where you're joining from today, I'm interested to hear if we've got an Irish cohort, if there's people from further afield, and what you hope to get out of today's session. Really good for me to know before I kind of launch into my spiel. As I go, also use the chat as a place just to document the questions that are coming up for you. Um, and we can use that then as a reference at the end. And again, just a reminder that we are recording today's session um, and uh, to be aware of that as well, but not the chat. So feel free to use the chat as I just described. So really briefly, um, I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting, if I look quickly at the names in the room, I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting any of you in person. Um, so I'm Gwen Cunningham. I am the lead for circularity and sustainability at NCAD. <clears throat> and I'm also uh, the one who has designed and who will primarily deliver on uh, this master's in circular design for textiles and fashion. And I, my own background is in design. I trained and worked as a designer, but very early on in my career, I have to say, I had a little bit of a, a crisis of faith. Maybe it's something some of you can empathize with where I understood, you know, the huge impact, the negative impact from a social and environmental perspective that the industry that I was in was having. And so you have this moment of, um, of crisis where you try and understand, do I, do I leave or do I stay and try and change it from within? And I decided to stay and try to change it from within. So the last, you know, 11 years have been purely dedicated to trying to shift industry practice. Um, and I do that kind of in, in two ways. So on one hand, I've been working over in the Netherlands for the last 10 years with an impact organization there called Circle Economy. And we really work with industry. Um, so all across the supply chain, whether it's manufacturers, brands, you know, um, innovators in the space of rental, resale, recycling, collectors, sorters, waste management organizations, working with these groups to help them 
change their practice and also collaborate to create kind of the systems change that's needed. Um, so oftentimes that's either looking at how do you prevent textile waste from being generated through circular design principles, through things like circular business models, or how do you reduce the amount of textile waste being generated through things like repair, upcycling, recycling at scale, and all of the kind of technology and uh, infrastructure development that has to happen to enable those systems to actually function uh, at scale and well. So that's been really on the ground work with industry. And then I suppose my heart's always been in education because I didn't have any kind of training when I was going through um, third level education on the topic of sustainability and circularity. And I felt and I feel so strongly that it's such a critical component of what it means to be a designer. Um, and so I've always tried to take the work that I've been doing in industry and re-embed it back into education. And that's why it has been such a pleasure to build uh, this program and uh, really looking forward now to finally launching it and getting people in the room uh, to run it from September next year. So that's a brief intro to myself. The urgency for change, I suppose, <clears throat> is of course very linked to that. You know, we live, and this is not just textiles, we live in what we would call a linear world, whereby we take resources, we make stuff which we sell, we use for increasingly short amounts of time, and by and large, much of what we use and produce gets wasted. And when I say it's not just textiles, you know, if you really zoom out and you take a bird's eye, perspective of our globe, of our world, you would see something like this. This is a, a visualization, quite a complex visualization by that impact organization I mentioned, Circular Economy over in the Netherlands. And what they did was they tried to take an X-ray of our world in terms of what are the materials that we extract every year? Minerals, you see these on the left-hand side, minerals, ores, fossil fuels, biomass. How do those materials get uh, manipulated and transformed through processing into products and services that then deliver on our societal needs. So housing, communication, mobility, healthcare, consumables, that's where textiles would live, nutrition. And then this tiny kind of almost indistinguishable gray line at the very end of this complex graphic is how much of those materials are then captured post-use and recycled back into the system as a secondary resource. And what you see from this graphic is that that tiny gray line is only 7.2%. So we're, we're only capturing 7.2% of our total material extraction and reintegrating it back into the system. So you could say that we are 7.2% circular. So that's kind of the current state of play when you look at a, a global picture. And of course, textiles is, and for a long time has been, and it's not something we should be proud of, kind of the poster child of this linear way of working, um, taking vast amounts of resources to produce fiber, um, to make huge volumes of product. We know that we reached a very terrifying kind of threshold a few years ago. We now have over a hundred billion new items of clothing being produced every year. Um, we have, what, 11, 11 thereabouts billion people on the planet, but 100 billion new items of clothing. Using that clothing for, for less and less time, um, we know, for instance, that in just a 15-year period, we started using our clothing for half as long as we used to. And a lot of research specifically pointing at fast fashion and saying that over half of fast fashion um, that's produced within a year is disposed of within that same year. And then waste, that really complex, messy, fascinating part of the value chain where we let go of something, what happens to it? That opens up an entirely different end of use value chain. Um, and about 73% on a global scale of all textiles and clothing is being landfilled or incinerated at the moment, which is just such a massive waste of this precious resource um, that does take so much water, energy, chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, to produce and then uh, ends up being wasted. So that system is in this hyper acceleration mode. Um, 
And it's really, you know, it's gotten out of control. And for me, the power um, of design is the power to reimagine how that system operates. And it's not just to do with products. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it really does start with design. And it's estimated, maybe you've seen this before, that over 80% of all product-related environmental impacts are determined during the design phase of a product. So that means, you know, when you're at that stage and you're making what might seem like quite simple decisions about color, fabric, cut, um, level of embellishment, um, where it's going to be produced, um, how, how quickly, how much, all of these things are locking in environmental impacts. And so as designers, we have an incredible amount of responsibility um, to do things better. And through another lens, you could say we have an incredible um, opportunity and power to really shift things in the right direction. And the right direction for, for me and in the kind of context of this master specifically is shifting from linear to circular. So how do we take that take, make, sell, use, waste model and reimagine it so that it's actually um, less reliant on virgin materials because we're introducing secondary materials through uh, recycled fiber in this instance, but we're also extending the life of the products that we do produce through repair, reuse, resale, remanufacturing. And of course, we're producing less, we're producing better, we're producing non-toxic, healthy products into the system in the first instance. And all of this in a way that is just, right? So this has, of course, an environmental um, core, I would say, or emphasis, but we cannot forget the social side of things. And if you're in this space, you'll know that the language now and absolutely the model that we're looking at when we look at the masters is the transition to a just and circular textiles industry. And that brings up a whole other set of questions that we'll be addressing. So redesigning materials so that they're made from safe and recycled and renewable inputs. Redesigning products so that they're made with minimal waste, made to last. That's the question of longevity, durability, something that is um, much, um, I would say, threatened in today's textiles and apparel industry and made to be made again. So how can we design products, not just with one life in mind, but with a second life, a third life, a fourth life? Um, and that has to do with recyclability and all of the kind of key design strategies that you need to make something that can be chemically or mechanically recycled. But it's also to do with designing for repairability, designing for reusability, for modularity, for versatility. These are ways to ensure that a product has more than one life. And designing the system, because you can make a perfectly circular product, put it into the world, but unless the underlying system is there to ensure it actually moves in a circular way, then all you've done, unfortunately, is put some circular intent out there. So the system is really the mechanism which allows your intent to be realized. Um, and that opens up the door, as I said before, to questions around collection, sortation, repair, recycling, and um, business models like a rental, like resale, all of those underlying structures um, that allow for circularity to take place. So this is a very, um, you know, I would say worthy and um, inspired vision for the industry, but how do we make it happen in practice? Well, the change is happening. I've seen massive shift in the last 10 years um, in the right direction. And a lot of it right now is being driven by strong signals of upcoming regulatory measures. Now, policy may not seem like the sexiest thing to some of you on the call, but it has an enormous power um, to act as kind of both the carrot and the stick in terms of getting you know, the players along the whole textiles value chain to align and to move in the right direction. And a few uh, years ago, the EU published their textiles 2030 strategy. And that outlines a really compelling vision for what the industry needs to look like by 2030. They say that by 2030, all textile products placed on the EU market need to be durable, repairable, and recyclable. 
already an incredible ambition to have, to a great extent made of recycled fibers, um, free of hazardous substances, that's to do with the non-toxicity, the clean inputs into the system, and produced in respect of social rights. And they back this up with a whole kind of host of other measures to do with separate textile collection, to do with product passports. So this is setting a really interesting uh, stage, I suppose, for change to happen. They also announced um, a mandatory EU-wide extended producer responsibility um, measure, which would essentially demand that all people who are putting product on the market, so that's brands and retailers, take responsibility for the product beyond the point of sale so that they actually have, have to play an active role or um, fund another third party player to play an active role in ensuring that the product does get collected, repaired, reused, recycled at its highest value once it reaches its end of life. And that those measures will also encourage those same brands and retailers to design better and design for circularity. So this is really interesting stuff that will also give rise from your perspective to a whole flurry of activity um, at a brand and retailer level, a whole flurry of jobs opening up in this space and just kind of set, set sail in the right direction. And you see that response coming um, already. Designers, retailers, brands globally are developing and rolling out, you know, kind of getting ahead of regulation and voluntarily rolling out circular design guides, programs, pilots, targets. We don't have time to go through the myriad of fascinating case studies that we see at the moment, but this will be really part of the education that you get to understand kind of the landscape at the moment, what's working, what's not working, what are the best case examples? What are the examples of failure? Because that's also so interesting to learn from. Why did something not work? Um, how could it have been done better? What can we take from it and move forward with? So this will be very much part of it and getting in these companies to speak with us, getting in experts to also help us unpack these things as we go. And experts and kind of, let's say these enabling organizations also play a huge role. So governments, uh, trade associations, academic and research institutions, they're also very active in this space. So for instance, in the UK, you've got RAP, um, uh, Textiles 2030 initiative, a voluntary national agreement that's being led by RAP, which is a, really a, a not-for-profit and a research uh, institution. And they're convening all of the stakeholders in the textiles value chain around common principles and targets and driving the whole industry forward in the UK together. So lots of fascinating examples of this kind of multi-stakeholder collaboration supported or driven by academia or by um, these uh, independent kind of third parties, um, but very much industry focused. And that's really kind of in a way what NCAD and CFA together are trying to do in the Irish context is also play an enabling role by developing all of these new programs and offerings in this space that will on one hand, you know, help to upskill existing professionals in the textiles and fashion space and also make sure that current graduates are uh, leaving with the skills that they need and we kind of kicked off this work back in 2022 we had our circular by design pilot that we ran together with the design and crafts council and this took a handful of brands from all across the country you see um, the first cohort here um, on kind of a, a six month journey whereby they were trained up in circular economy and circular design thinking. And they themselves applied these principles to their own business operations, their own product design processes and came up with new circular design products, services, um, et cetera, over that course of the, the project. And apart from you know, the core brands that were going through this quite intensive process with us, we also built a community of practice, which was a wider community of players all across Ireland that are also curious and interested in this topic and were engaged through webinars and various different events. Because I think so much of the work that needs to be done is also in creating this movement here in Ireland. Um, and this will be very much 
what we do as well with the masters. You know, you won't just be 15 people in a room, you will be connected to a wider network of experts, of companies, of enablers. And really um, this is built with and for industry, this program. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but if you are curious to look into the Circular by Design pilot, it might give you a little bit of a sense of, I suppose, kind of the principles that we work from, um, which is very much about collaborative experiential learning. So for instance, one of the first things that we did with this group was we brought them to a textile waste facility and really had them experience firsthand what the end of use value chain looks like why it's working and why it's not working. Um, I'm a big believer uh, in, you know, this, these moments and these experiential moments as, as learning moments. I will never forget the first time I stepped foot in a um, huge European sorter, textile waste sorters facility in the Netherlands. Um, and I suppose the realization that every decision I had made as a designer was directly impacting whether something could be resold, could be recycled at that moment. So how do you connect the end of use value chain with the design stage? I often say that, you know, the designer needs to marry the garbage man, but in order to, to make it work, you really need to, you need to integrate these players that oftentimes would never even get to meet or speak. So how do we bring them together and create space for that dialogue? So just to give you a sense, um, a lot of it was held online um, because we had such a diverse group who are really coming from all over the country. And that, if, if you haven't worked collaboratively online, it can be a daunting task. But I suppose just to say that, you know, the, the, the way of working online has, has come on so much and it can be a fantastic experience to learn and work online together. Um, and it's really based off of you know, the success of, of models like this, that we had the confidence to build the hybrid program, the master's program that we're gonna talk about today. Um, it will not, just because we're online, it doesn't mean that it will be dry lectures where we send information. It will be very much interactive um, sessions online, working you know, in a team with yourselves, with myself, with the other CFA lectures, and then also the beauty of online is that we can get a whole host of international experts to join on a continual basis without having the carbon footprint of flying them here, there and everywhere. So it opens up a huge opportunity as well from a curriculum perspective. So these were some of the organizations, the individuals that for instance joined us um, for that pilot. You know, we had the likes of <clears throat> um, Adidas, uh, Recover Textiles, huge mechanical recyclers based in Valencia, Spain. Um, Eileen Fisher from the US, if you know them, an incredible B Corp um, circular you know, brand that have really been leading the charge on this for, for 20 years and more. So this is um, very much kind of the principles that we're gonna be bringing into the masters. And these are some of the illustrations that capture the changes that the brands who went through the program made to their own businesses and to their products. Um, and I'll share this all with you afterwards as well. So you can, you can look into this um, in more detail if you want. But I do wanna to move to the masters and spend some time on it. Um, so the practicalities of the Circular by Design masters, um, it's 90 credits. Um, so the level is, is level nine. We kick off September 2024 and it's two years, so it will run until June 2026. The group size is a really lovely size, if you ask me. We've got 15 uh, places um, and that's, you know, big enough to have great diversity, small enough to still have a lot of contact time and I suppose the, the intimacy of a learning experience that I think will really benefit you as an individual rather than huge, huge class sizes. The format, as I mentioned, is hybrid um, and really combining lectures, seminars um, with more interactive masterclasses, workshops, group presentations and tutorials. So it's really a mixed learning uh, method. And I think one thing to note, you would have seen this on the website, is that we will expect learners to be on the NCAD campus for an in-person day once every three weeks. Um, and we're still locking in what exact day that is, because I know, especially for those of you who are 
in work or trying to combine this part-time master's with uh, a job in the industry, that's really important to know. So we will know that soon enough and be making sure that that information gets updated uh, online. The time commitment is um, in, the, in the region of 20 hours per week. And about eight hours of that is direct contact time. So that will be those lectures, seminars, masterclasses, workshops. And the rest will be really individual self-led worker study, which in the moments when uh, there's teamwork involved in projects could also be team-led uh, work and study. The fees you would have seen four and a half uh, grand per year and an application fee um, in this case of 55 euro. And I was just let know before we went on uh, today that if you are an NCAD graduate or soon to be graduate, that application fee doesn't apply to you. So that's good to know. And the application date, really important, is coming up soon enough. It's the 29th of March. Um, and, and so if you're interested, we would encourage you to just get in that application um, you know, as soon as you can um, so that your name is in the hat. So who is it for? The program's been really built with two distinct uh, profiles in mind. The first is um, what I call the future industry professional. So this would be recent textile or fashion graduates, you know, who are at the start of their career um, and looking to really specialize their professional career and practice around sustainability and develop a strong portfolio of sustainability related work. Maybe you feel like you didn't get that education in you know, your prior education and your bachelor's or wherever you come from. And you know that in order to enter into the working world, you need to have that, that basis, but you also need to have a portfolio you know, um, in your back pocket that speaks to your expertise in this space. Um, and who is also looking to generate a network of industry contacts that are relevant in the field. I have, you know, on a weekly basis, lots of inquiry and requests for coffees from, from people around the world who are looking to enter into this field. And it can be a daunting task, you know, it is a growing space, but it's also quite an insular space. It can be hard to break into the kind of sustainability um, fashion or sustainable textiles space. And so this would give you those, those inroads, I suppose, and open up the doors to, um, to the right people. The second profile that we imagine is what I call the current professional. So this is textile and apparel designers, buyers, brands, or um, people working in manufacturing even, who are really looking to upskill and reorientate their career or their brand towards sustainability. Um, so they may have an interest, you know, because they're already in the industry in really just getting up to date knowledge um, and expertise on the latest innovations, trends, certifications, even regulation coming to, down the line. Maybe you're a brand that's been in existence for quite some time, but you're really trying to grapple with how this regulation will affect you and how you will need to shift your own business practices to align. And of course, building a community of like-minded peers, something that we saw really strongly coming through from um, the Circular by Design pilot, one of the biggest benefits that people spoke to was just not feeling alone in their journey uh, anymore because they felt now that they had this support ne network, this peer network. So in terms of course content, um, upon completion of the program, learners will be able to demonstrate a mature and nuanced knowledge and understanding of circular design and the successful acquisition of a range of related research, practice-based and professional skills. The application of this knowledge, so it's very much combining theory and practice, the application of this knowledge and skills to develop a body of original, ambitious and intellectually informed work, which adds value to the system or the stakeholders in the field. So not just projects for project's sake, but really projects that give new insight, new thinking, and new value to the uh, system, to the industry, as it tries to make this transition. So very much <clears throat> industry-led, industry-focused, um, or has the potential to be further developed by the learner at a doctoral level or world of work. Communicate, articulate, defend with confidence, 
and a professional attitude, their values, purpose, design practice, research project findings to multiple audiences through comprehensive written, spoken and visual outputs. So that's really about that presentation piece and demonstrate an ability to work in a self-directed manner, as well as to effectively collaborate and co-create with the team and with external stakeholders and clients to develop and establish relevant circular design solutions for various contexts and uh, audiences. So there will be a combination of, you know, individual projects, team projects, and a lot of work where you are actually working with and for industry partners. So I'm going to explain that in a bit more detail. I mean, the, the program itself is built kind of off the back of this model, this framework. Maybe it's familiar to you from uh, Rebecca Early from the University of Arts London, the Centre for Circular Design. And this model is really interesting because it essentially speaks a little bit to what I would have said earlier in that we don't only need to rethink materials, but we also need to rethink the model, the system and what they call the self and the mindset. So we've actually used this framework as the structure on which we built uh, the program. So I'm very briefly gonna give a high level kind of insight into the, the way the program breaks down in terms of the different trimesters. So um, we have a start obviously in September. So you enter in at the autumn trimester and the first um, three modules together is really the motivations uh, part of the program. So in this phase, you will be provided with a holistic overview of why change is urgently needed, what wicked complex challenges the industry is currently facing. And really uh, you'll be working in teams to start to investigate and critique the existing paradigm and explore future scenarios that are just and circular by design. So you'll get a really fundamental grounding, common knowledge and understanding of, you know, the, the current state of play, but also the circular economy, the various different elements and strategies that uh, it encompasses, where it came from, how it relates to other sustainability frameworks. Um, and then you'll also be working with the tools of speculative design to imagine what the industry could and should look like. So that's the first trimester. The second trimester then dives deep into the world of material and product. So you will be getting a broad and deep understanding of current and emergent thinking, innovation, trends and technologies related to circular materials and circular product design. And you will be exploring, producing and presenting ambitious circular design projects um, for the first time. So when you get the fundamental basis in actually the kind of first um, module of this trimester and um, you'll be working at teams running design sprints to actually reimagine and redesign iconic product products together using these circular design principles and then in the um the second and third module within that trimester you will be teamed up with a real life uh, organization and working with that business to analyze their products and to redesign them according to circular principles. So there's in that second um, trimester, there's a real real life uh, component to it where you'll be working directly with industry. The third trimester then is the mindsets trimester. This is perhaps to some of you a little bit of an unusual um, addition to the program. Um, but it's really critically important. This is about really looking at what is the mindset and the leadership skills that you need to effectively cross boundaries between sectors, specialisms, geographies, generations, backgrounds and beliefs in order to affect change beyond your own direct sphere of influence. You know, I'm a big believer that it's not just enough to have the technical skill um, you really also need to have the soft skills, the skills of collaboration, leadership, um, and so on to affect change, to become a real change maker in the industry. And so this, this module is purely looking at that question of how do I affect change? The first um, module within this is actually a, a module where we will look at the kind of framing of what does it mean to lead beyond authority? And you'll be teamed up with a mentor that will guide you through this whole trimester. 
We'll also have a module looking at um, communications um, and psychology and how to affect change with the consumer, which is obviously very important. And then you'll also have a module where you're working outside of the discipline of textiles and fashion and understanding what it means to affect change with other disciplines uh, in the room. Moving on to then the second year. So um, we move in the fourth trimester to the very interesting question of business models. So you will be uh, looking at circular business models and service design. And this will be really pulling in also the knowledge and the expertise from the service design masters that runs in parallel to your masters at the same time. So that will be a great kind of opportunity for cross learning uh, between two masters programs. And then you really round up your masters with two major projects, a major research project where you will decide on a research topic um, that you wanna pursue over that period and essentially develop your own brief um, and own project outline that you get guided through and a major design project, which is more focused uh, on the physical product or service um, that you wanna develop, prototype and test in that period. And that's very much self-directed work that's then supported by um, the staff. But really, you know, this is your chance, I suppose, to really craft, start crafting that portfolio for yourself that's gonna launch you uh, out into the world. So in terms of entry requirements, you would have seen this on the website, so it shouldn't be too much new uh, information for you. All applicants are expected to present an approved bachelor degree at minimum um, 2-2. Um, if you don't have that, you may be considered on the basis of prior work or learning experience. Um, so that's good to know. Uh, and also <clears throat> you can apply for the program if you're still studying at the moment or still completing your undergraduate degree. Um, you know, we could offer a conditional offer at this stage. And when your degree is completed uh, to the appropriate level, you'd send us your final transcripts and then you would get a full offer. Um, depending on the level of interest and how oversubscribed we are, there might be an interview process that will be determined uh, at a later stage. And apart from that, let's say, basic uh, entry level requirement, there's also some supporting documents that you'll provide uh, us with. So a statement of interest, 500 to 1,500 words, framing your reason, your rationale, essentially your motivation for applying to the program. This is like the cover letter. This is your chance to really, you know, put forward why you want to do this, why you're a perfect fit. Um, and this is a really important um, document, you know, um, because it will be one of the, the things that really helps to set you apart from the rest in terms of your, yeah, your underlying motivation and interest um, and your argumentation for why you are a good fit for the program. That's supported by a recent CV. You know, again, the tendency might be you have a CV, just send it on, but really look at your CV through the lens of this program and framing your experience and your expertise according to the skills and knowledge um, that we're looking for. Um, that's always a good idea. Certified transcripts of previous programs, certified copies of degrees or certificates, um, and where appropriate, if English isn't your first language, an English language proficiency uh, cert certificate. So that's good to bear in mind. And then there's the additional supporting documents to really give evidence of previous work undertaken. So this is in a way what you could call your portfolio. But when we say portfolio, we're very open to it being a visual portfolio that shows a body of, for instance, design work that's relevant, or it could be um, written a portfolio of work. So it could be documentation of a project that you are involved in that could be more technical or theoretical in nature. Um, it could be a case study um, that you've completed. So it's really to showcase your skill set that you feel is relevant for the program. And that needn't be physical designed products. And um, that's really important to emphasize because as you've seen, this program is not just about materials and products, it's also about systems thinking, 
It's about communication design. So there's much more here and you can speak to um, your kind of varied expertise. Career opportunities very quickly, because I want to give time for questions. As I said, this is a really evolving space. Um, but just if we take a very quick kind of snapshot of what I've seen bubbling up in the last year on LinkedIn. So this is really kind of like a live um, scraping of the Internet. I see that there's a whole host of, of new um, roles popping up in circular design and development, circular design assistants, senior circular <coughs> managers in PVH. They manage Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger and um, circular supply chain systems design, postdoctoral researchers. So also at, a, at an academic uh, level. There's more scientific um, roles coming uh, to the fore, which are more oftentimes more materials focused around responsible sourcing, raw material innovation um, to do with instance for um, material um, management and innovation, um, in, especially in the kind of recycling sector, this is becoming a huge area of interest. Sustainability managers more broadly, um, these would be very, very common roles within brands. Um, and, you know, it used to be the case that you would have a lone sustainability manager within a huge multinational brand. Now they're building out full teams, oftentimes even departments around sustainability. So this is becoming a very, very commonplace um, type of profile to see advertised for. And then we've got these very kind of new roles emerging um, that are linked to the innovations happening on the ground. So for instance, you know, because of the advance and the boom that we've seen in resale, there's a huge amount of jobs in the authentication space. So really working to be the kind of person, the point of contact who's authenticating if something um, that says that it's a certain brand is a certain brand um, and that type of, um, I suppose, end of use supply chain work, which is really uh, interesting space. And that also has to do with recycling.